So uh, welcome everyone for this uh, second keynote uh, session. So I have the pleasure, of course, to, to introduce Rama Kant. So Rama Kant is a professor at the Mathematical Institute at Oxford University. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, we know Rama Kant since a very long time, since uh, before being in UK, he has a kind of French life. And uh, in particular, this is, I would say, a typical example of uh, one of the first generation of research in finance, in the sense that uh, it is one of the first uh, phases in mathematics which was completely focused on finance. And it was not so obvious to create this special topic in mathematics. Just to give an idea of the title, uh, modélisation statistique des marchés financiers, uh, statistic modeling of financial markets. Okay, with uh, supervisor uh, Bouchot, that uh, some of the people know very well too. So he has uh, a lot of publication. Just to give you an idea, uh, maybe four or five publication per year. So you have to multiply by the number of years to have an idea of what he is doing. He is uh, specialized in quantitative finance, uh, both theoretical pricing formulas, uh, different modeling, complicated modeling for implied volatility surface or for uh, interest rates, but also in statistics. Okay? And he's mixing these different topics. And more recently, of course, this uh, numerical aspect, and this is this kind of thing you will discuss today. Uh, I have also to, to say that he, he has received some years ago the prize from the uh, Institute de Bachelier. So he is, of course, very welcome to, to be here again. So maybe you can come and explain what you are doing currently in your research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. It's a pleasure for me to be introduced by Christian because I learned a lot as a student from him. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to present this work. So uh, I'm going to talk about the generative AI and some applications in finance. And so this picture is, of course, an example of generative AI. We generated with DALI, which is the, the gra graphical companion to ChatGPT. So uh, this is joint work with colleagues in Oxford, Mihai Kukuringu and Chao Zhang and Jin Yun Shu, who is at the University of Southern California. So the topic is what uh, an algorithm we call TailGAN. It's uh, an algorithm for learning to simulate market scenarios. But in the first part, I will more generally speak about issues related to the use of generative AI in finance and some challenges. And then I'll describe an example, which is this algorithm TailGAN. Okay, so the, the, this is associated with a paper which you can find online if you want more technical details. I try to focus on the conceptual aspects and the algorithm here. Okay, so uh, what is generative AI? I guess many of you have heard of it everywhere because this is a, a topic you hear about in the press even. Uh, so generative AI refers to uh, the, a category of machine learning algorithms that learn from a data set to generate um, outputs similar to the ones encountered in the data set, but not identical. Now these data sets can be data sets of images, of videos, they can be numbers, uh, arrays, balance sheets, whatever you have. The algorithm uh, uh, learns from the data set the structure of these um, of this data and then we'll uh, learn to generate uh, or simulate samples which look like the ones you showed the algorithm. So um, in machine learning, uh, people uh, keep inventing new terminology to designate things which actually already existed before but they don't necessarily know about. And of course, generative models, uh, people who work in quantitative finance, they have been doing, they have been designing generative models for decades, just that they don't call them like that, they call them simulation. 
So generative models are nothing else but models for simulating something. But what's different here with respect to classical simulation methods is that they are non-parametric simulation methods. So basically, you, in the classical point of view in simulation, you write down a statistical model, you estimate it from data, and then you estimate coefficient from data, then you simulate it with uh, you know, uh, the classical Monte Carlo methods, and uh, this is the paradigm for the simulation that we have been using for decades in quantitative finance. Here, there is no explicit model for the simulation. You have something which is built on a neural network. The neural network learns to simulate instances from your data set, but you never have a functional mathematical description of the procedure which is simulating. Nonetheless, it is a simulation algorithm. So it's a non-parametric data-driven simulation algorithm. So you should think of these generative models as non-parametric data-driven simulation algorithm. And I will try to describe a little bit how they function. So there are many uh, algorithms under the name of generative AI. Some uh, popular methods that have been quite successful in certain applications in the historical order in which they appeared are variational autoencoders. They appeared around 15 years ago. They are used uh, um, in finance for certain simulation tasks. Then we had an explosion of generative models with the appearance of generative adversarial networks or GANs. I'm going to speak more about them in a few minutes. Uh, around 2004-14, we had uh, a, new, uh, a new generation of generative models which uh, exploded, especially in large language models called uh, generative pre-trained transformers, or GPTs, and you know of, of course, ChatGPT, but that's just an example of a whole range of uh, generative models that have been used extensively for large language models. And more recently, there's a, there's a new class of models which are closer to the classical simulation models that we know of. These are score-based diffusions that use a, a probabilistic approach to <laughs> simulate from large data sets. So, so I will speak more about uh, GANs, uh, but uh, these are all models that have been used uh, in other applications and are progressively being deployed in finance. If you're interested more generally in issues related to synthetic data and generative models, we uh, wrote a report last year in November on, uh, with the MIT Technology Review on uh, the application generative AI in financial services and uh, some obstacles to their deployment, so you can find this and online at, at the web website of the MIT Technology Review. So now let's go a little bit more into detail. So what are we doing here? Well, in classical simulation methods, so think of, for example, simulating a, a sample from a one-dimensional distribution F. Well, uh, what you do classically is that you, you have a random number generator which generates, for example, <coughs> uniformly distributed random variables. And if you know your target distribution F explicitly, then there is a simple algorithm which is taught in all Monte Carlo simulation courses. You apply the inverse of F to the uh, uniformly distributed random variables, and you get samples which have the distribution F exactly the one you need. So this is the classical simulation um, uh, uh, approach. If you know your target distribution F explicitly, and if it's simple enough so it can be inverted. Uh, here, uh, what we're interested in in these application generative AI is simulating from an unknown distribution. So you have a data sample, which is very large, but you don't know explicitly the distribution, but you have enough data, so you say, well, I can get information from the data. So you have an unknown target distribution, and typically it's in a high dimensional space. Think of a space of images. So a space of images, if you think about, uh, if you uh, parameterize an image with pixels, you have a million of pixels. So you are in, di in dimension one million, for example, something like that. So you have an unknown target distribution in a high dimensional space, but you have plenty of data. So the idea is, well, if you knew the explicit distribution F, you would just invert F, so you would apply transformation G, which is the inverse of F, but uh, you're going to learn this transformation G, which is also called a generator, from the data. So I don't know F explicitly, but I have plenty of data. Can I learn the transformation G from data? And the idea is, in, as usual in these deep learning applications, I'm going to parameterize G with a neural network. So there's an underlying theoretical result called the universal approximation theorem, which says that 
you can approximate practically any function in high dimensions with a neural network if you uh, have a correct architecture. So I will take a neural network which has enough depth and we're going to train the weights of the neural network in order to learn how to generate this uh, uh, function g, the generator learn this function g from the sum sample uh, with the, the desired distribution. So this is the, uh, the static version of it which has been, uh, which was initially developed for example for simulating images. In, in financial applications we're often interested in something even more ambitious, we want to uh, generate a dynamic process, for example, uh, time series, uh, some series of stock prices, high, high, high dimensional time series of multi assets uh, time series for stock prices. Then, uh, well, what we're interested in really is uh, given the history of the data up to now, given the market information up to time t, uh, we're interested in sampling from the conditional distribution, so there is uh, even more, more in information encoded in the data. So we want to apply this process, learning the generator, but at each time t to the conditional distribution. Okay, so that's the, that's the challenge. So one, uh, one solution which was proposed by Goodfellow and co-authors in 2014 is uh, in the form of what's called generative adversarial type network. So the idea is, well, you want to train this generator, which is a neural pet network, and um, you actually train two net networks at the same time, and you think of this as a two-person game. So you have two neural networks, one generates samples, and the other one is going to test these samples and tell you whether they're good or not, whether they are, uh, whether uh, their likelihood that they come from the data is high or not, and reject or accept them. So you have these two networks, the G and D, generator and discriminator, so the generator will generate new samples based on the random input. The discriminator takes the output of the generator and compares it to the real data and says yes or no, this is acceptable or not. And the idea is that you then uh, train these two networks um, by iterating, it's like a repeated game between these two players. You iterate, uh, um, you, you go through iterations where you uh, um, improve at each step through a gradient uh, step the, um, uh, the performance of each of these networks and uh, the goal of, for, for the generator is to produce output that is statistically indistinguishable from the real data and the goal for the discriminator is to do a perfect test. So this is what's called adversarial training, so the generator and discriminator are trained simultaneously and iteratively improve each other's performance. So that's the GAN um, uh, paradigm, and that be, it, it has been used a lot for uh, generating images and videos, and uh, you've probably seen a lot of these things uh, uh, um, uh, in, in, in various <coughs> publications and, and the press. So that's an example of an output of, of a GAN. So on the left, you see a database of dog pictures, and then you train the GAN on this data set, and it generates, each time you give a random input, uh, uh, you ge generate a new picture of uh, a dog, which is not one of the dogs in the sample, but it's a new dog. And so you have real dogs on the left and the simulated dogs on the right. And uh, in this case, uh, the validation of the bottle, uh, this was the early applications of GAN, is to look at these pictures, say, do they look like dogs? Is it realistic or not? And in this case, it's easy. Anybody, even a dog probably, can uh, check if the output is re realistic. So that was the early examples of GAN. So um, now, uh, very quickly, people in finance said, oh, this is very interesting for a non-parametric simulation. Let's take these al algorithms and run them on time series. So this has been used to design so-called market simulators or market generators. So there's a lot of references here, and there are more uh, uh, as we uh, uh, as we go on, people do more and more applications of this. They <coughs> apply these to different types of financial data sets and they generate outputs. So I, I did talk, talk about the training, but typically the training in these uh, neural network settings is done by minimizing some distance between the output distribution and the sample and the, and the sample empirical distribution. So this uh, distance is typically either cross entropy or some uh, more elaborate distance like a Wasserstein distance. So the goal is that the output distribution is close in some sense to the distribution in the data. 
And so you minimize this by uh, iterating o over weight and you get a black box sim simulator that is supposed to generate good market scenarios. The question here is, how do you validate a model like this? For images, as we saw, you look at the dog and you say, this, likes, this looks like a realistic dog, but if you have uh, outputs which are arrays and arrays of uh, now numbers, if I ask you, if I ask an experienced quant, okay, I give you this array of uh, 10,000 uh, by 10,000 num numbers supposed to represent 10,000 returns of 10,000 stocks, does it look, look realistic? I don't think anybody can look at that and tell you if it's uh, realistic. So we cannot rely on user validation. We need to have a systematic algorithmic approach to model validation because the output is high dimensional arrays of numbers. There's no easy way to check. Um, so uh, that's, that's the n n number one issue, I, I think, in this. And that has been the obstacle to the widespread adoption of these models in finance because especially in re regulated institutions like banks, you have a model validation procedure and uh, the model validation teams often don't even know how to deal with these black box simulators. I mean, what do you check? Where are the assumptions? What's the structure? It's a black box. So uh, some of the issues here are that, well, first of all, what we are trying to simulate is not images but um, paths of you know, prices or or return, so it's a high dimensional space of paths indexed by some time index t. And uh, the, the other, so this is high, high, high dimensional, typically it's just number of time steps, sometimes number of the uh, um, assets. And uh, the second issue is that the criteria on which the theoretically the algorithm was to minimize, so for example, the cross entropy or something like, like that, if you knew exactly the distribution, the real distribution, and the output distribution, you could compute that, but you don't know any of these distributions. You have a sample from the empirical distribution, you have a sample from the output distribution, the simulated sample, and you use the sample to approximate this loss function. But this sample is not very large compared to the, uh, the dimension of your data uh, space. So it is, you're using a rather small sample to approximate even the loss function. So you're minimizing a loss function you don't even know exactly. You know it very approximately. Now the consequence of this is that your, uh, the, th the training criteria you're minimizing will be dominated by typical sam sample paths. Uh, and because it's dominated by typical sample paths, you will be um, basically m m minimizing some something which highly relies on a bunch of simulated sample paths that are actually small co compared to the size of your space. Now, in risk applications, if you're going to use these scenarios for risk evaluation of portfolios or backtesting of strategies, for example, you are typically interested in uh, the tail of the loss distributions of your portfolios. You're interested in the few scenarios where your portfolio blows up or you, uh, you have a high, high profit and these tail scenarios only occur by construction with small probability. They do not dominate or they may not contribute a lot to the training criterion that is uh, used in these scenarios. For images, it's okay because you actually want to simulate a typical dog. You don't want to simulate a mutant dog or some dog with three eyes. But in this case, the, the atypical sample path where there's a flash crash or some, uh, some uh, large uh, uh, fluctuation in prices, may be the ones which dominate your PNL. So if, you, uh, if your criteria is not sensitive to them, well, that's not good. It's not going to do your job. So in fact, uh, we want to take the problem the other way around. We say, okay, these scenarios, what are they going to be used for? What features of the scenarios of the outputs we are interested in? And then we should design a loss criterion which is sensitive to those features. Because if I, uh, if I have a blind algorithm that uh, optimizes something, then expose, I discover that uh, the, the way I design the outputs does not take into account what I'm interested in, that's, it's too late. So what are we interested in? If you were, you were simulating not dogs or cats, but financial scenarios, we are typically interested in computing the profit and loss of portfolios in these scenarios. That's the thing they are used for, for risk calculations, for backtesting, whatever. We always take a bunch of strategies and run them across the scenarios, calculate the PNL, and that's the ob object that is the input for 
risk cal cal calculations, valuations, everything. Okay, so what are these? Well, it means that I'm going to take a certain a number of uh, uh, investment strategies, let's call them five, so they specify the portfolios as they evolve in time. These portfolios are, so you can think of a strategy, an investment strategy is a map from the market scenario to portfolios. It tells you in this scenario, buy this, sell that. In that scenario, buy this, sell that. So it's a map which sends, if you input is the scenario, output is the portfolio. And if I integrate this portfolio along the path, I get the PNL, the profit and loss of the, of the, of the strategy. Okay, so basically, each specification of a trading strategy allows me to take the scenarios, compute the profit and loss. Okay? If I cannot co compute the profit and loss of a strategy on a scenario, it means I don't know what my strategy is. So this is the minimum requirement. Okay, so if I see now each strategy has a map from scenarios to, uh, to, to the real um, in, in number, the, this map gives me the profit over some horizon T of the scenario, now, well, uh, there is a mathematical result which, is, uh, uh, the, which says that if I have two, uh, uh, two uh, distributions of over scenarios such that for any uh, trading strategy, in fact, I can just take piecewise constant trading strategy because that's all there is. For any piecewise constant uh, trading stra strategy, I get the same loss distribution in uh, uh, for the set of scenarios one, set of scenarios two, then these two uh, sets of scenarios have the same loss, okay? So it means that it's enough to know the PNL distributions of all trading strategies. There's nothing else in the, in the distribution of scenarios. That's, it summarizes, it's a sufficient statistic for the distribution of scenarios. Okay, so this means that uh, the if I use as features of my scenario uh, distribution the profit and loss distributions of my strategies, that's enough. That's all uh, there is as information. There's no other information. Now, the idea here then is, okay, well, I may not be interested in all possible trading strategies, but a subset of them because I'm trading in a certain way. For example, I do momentum strategies, I do mean reversion strategies, I only deploy a subset of all possible trade strategies, uh, and I'm, I'm going to use this subset as features for extracting information from the scenarios if I can match the loss distributions of the subset of, of trading strategies that I use, that's actually enough for me. I don't care about the, all, uh, all uh, bizarre strategies that are conceivable. I actually care about the subset of strategies mine, okay? So that's the idea. I'm going to take this high dimensional scenario space and use as features the, uh, my trading strategies or the strategies specified by the end the user. Each strategy extracts some information in the form of a loss distribution, which will depend on the pathwise pro properties of these scenarios. So for example, mean reversion and momentum strategy will be sensitive to different properties of the of the, of the scenarios, trend, trend following strategies will be sensitive to trends, uh, mean reversion strategies will be sensitive to mean reversion pop properties of the scenario, and um, I will be extracting the information which gives me the correct loss distribution for this strategy. The good thing now is that the loss of a portfolio is a number, so it's a random variable in one dimension. I start from a very high, high dimensional set of uh, uh, scenarios I want to sample, but now I end up with K one-dimensional distributions. These are the profit and loss of my K strategies. And it's much easier to learn to match one-dimensional distributions, we know a lot about them, than it is to match a 10,000-dimensional distribution. So this dimension reduction, though, is a financially meaningful one because I can understand what I've done at the end of the algorithm. I have matched I have uh, designed a simulator which matches correctly the loss distribution of K, uh, my K chosen uh, trading strategies rather than some abstract the pro pro property like the cross entropy approximated by itself. Okay, so that's the idea. So you can think of it if you're familiar with the dis discretizations of partial differential equations, things like that. It's a projection, but this slide is for Raphael Diaby. Uh, so you can think of it as a projection method. You have this strategy, each strategy projects uh, on one direction, and uh, it 
it integrates along the path uh, in a certain way which depends on the properties of the strategy. So the idea is to think of the space of strategies as a dual of the path space, and you're discretizing the dual rather than discretizing the path space. Okay. Now, the second thing we want is that, okay, we have these loss distributions. I want to learn these loss distributions, but what do I want to learn about the loss distribution? So remember that, you know, typical uh, approaches such as sample-based cross-entropy cross will be a, a sensitive focus uh, concentrated on typical sample paths. If I want, for example, for risk purposes to be sensitive to the tail risk of the strategies, well, I should design a loss function or a training criterion which is sensitive to, to the tail of the loss distributions. Well, uh, there we, we appeal to statistical theory. So the idea is that if you look at tail statistics such as value at risk or expected shortfall, actually, well, the usual way to estimate value at risk and expected shortfall is that you take your losses, simulated losses, you order them, and then you compute the order statistics, the second biggest loss, the 10th biggest loss, and so on. But there is a, another unnatural way to estimate these same things. It is to minimize a certain score function. But you would typically never do that nat naturally, but there is a whole theory in statistics called M-statistics, so statistics which can be estimated to the minimization or maximization of a score fun function, rather. And these statistics are called elicitable statistics. And so there has been an interesting literature uh, uh, in the last decade where people said, well, can we estimate value at risk and expected shortfall by minimizing some score fun fun function? And the answer is yes, there is a whole range of score functions uh, uh, which can be used to estimate value at risk and expected shortfall. These were uh, completely characterized by Achebe and Settele and Fisler et al. So there is a score function which I call here S alpha, and there is a whole family of them, in fact, uh, which if you minimize this over your sample, the minimizer gives you the value at risk and expected shortfall at your desired confidence level alpha. Okay, why am I talking about this? Well. If this score function, the minimization, gives you the uh, detailed statistics of, of your loss distribution, if I now use this score function as my training cri criterion on the simulated sample, so I compare the score fun fun function in the simulated sample and uh, the uh, real sample, it means that I'm going to try to match the tail statistics, uh, the value at risk and expected shortfall. So uh, by using this trick, you incorporate in the training a criterion which, if you minimize this, it will give you a consistent estimator of the value at risk and expected chart shortfall of your portfolio. So this is a, a result coming from statistical theory that we use here. So now to, but to summarize, I, I'm going to take the following two ingredients. I'm going to take uh, K strategies, these are training strategies specified by the user. I ask you, sir, which, uh, what would you like uh, to use the outputs of the scenario generator for? You, you tell me, well, I have these training strategies, I want to match the loss distribution. I say, okay, fine, give me your training strategies. Uh, using these training strategies, I can map each scenario to a PNL, to a loss. So these will be K maps, and for each map, it takes the path and gives me the loss along that path. And now I want to, uh, uh, to uh, optimize over the generator parameters such that these paths give me the correct tail statistics for the loss di distributions, and there I'm going to use my score function. So the, uh, so the score function is what's called S alpha. The score function S alpha, remember, if we minimize it, will match the uh, expected value, uh, expected shortfall and the var of the two samples. So I'm going to compare. Uh, I'm going to pl plug in the, the simulated sound samples inside the score function, and I force them to match the, the details of the same portfolios in the real data, okay? So that will give you the last fun fun function for the discriminator. And, uh, and so what we'll have here is the, the score function will appear both in the generator and the, in the discriminator. The goal of the generator is to best match the, the tail statistics across the set of K benchmark strategies, and the discriminator will try to see whether the, uh, the, uh, the, tail, uh, the tail statistics of the loss distributions in the real and the simulated samples are close or not by, 
by co computing the same score function. So that's the idea, okay? So, uh, so that's the ar architecture, the generator, uh, the simulate scenarios. Uh, it runs the scenarios through these, what, what we call the benchmark strategies. The, the benchmark strategies then lead to uh, a bunch of pathways, uh, 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 a, a vector of, of, of the PNLs across the scenarios. And then you, uh, you compare uh, the, uh, but the PNLs of these scenarios in the, in the uh, actual data and the simulated data with this score function. And this leads to a score which then leads the, the output to be accepted or rejected. That's the discrimination. So that's the, uh, the idea. Now, um, okay, so this, uh, then you have a GAN which is uh, basically a two-two person game be between the generator and the discriminator. You're going to uh, optimize the scenario, the, the parameters of the networks iteratively through um, a, um, uh, uh, through um, alternative gradient updates of the generator and the, the discriminator. From this point on onwards, it's the usual GAN algorithm, but what we have is a, is a loss fun function which is designed to answer a specific question and, it's, uh, and the ingredients are completely explainable and have a nice definition interpretation. So now I'm going to show you some results. Now, it, it's, so all the other uh, approaches that I said in the beginning, they train again on the raw time series. So what that learns is the distribution of the returns of the time series, okay? And in almost all of the, uh, the, the, the references I cited, except one, they're actually one-dimensional time series. Here, of course, for every portfolio I choose, every strategy I choose, I get a one-dimensional time series of returns, but I choose k different strategies. Each of them gives me a quite different one-dimensional projection of my high-dimensional high series. And what I'm going to show you is that the more, uh, the more diverse is the set of strategies you choose, the more information you extract from the data. And I'm going to show you especially that it is crucial to select dynamic strategies as well as static strategies. If you just select buy and hold static strategies, you're actually only learning the distribution of one period of return. But if you select dynamic strategies such as momentum or mean reversion or some, something more complicated, you're going to learn pathwise properties of the uh, time series that you cannot learn just with the raw series. Okay, so here is an example of the difference between training on dynamic strategies and training just on the raw time series or static core portfolios. So what we show here is the out of sample error on the forecasting of the value at risk and expected shortfall. So, uh, if you have, if, if you know in the theoretical case where you know the true model, so this is a test of simulated data, if you know the true model and you simulate a sample of size 1,000, you will have a statistical error on the value at risk and expected shortfall. That is what it is. If you don't know what it is, you check Chris Young's books and you will find the statistical error uh, nicely expressed there. That corresponds to the gray uh, line uh, which is down there. It's the st statistical error due to finite sus sample. It's the oracle error. You cannot go below that even if you have the true model. So, yes, yes, I'm going to do So the out of sample error cannot go below that. And what we see is that <laughs> if you only train on static portfolios or on the raw time series initially, you are well above that. You can approach that. Whereas if you train with uh, a mix of static and dynamic lines, you actually are, are able, after 1,500 iterations, to actually approach the theoretical level of, uh, uh, of the oracle. And so this uh -huh. means that you can uh, Microphone, sir, yes, yes. So uh, it is essential to include dynamic training strategies in uh, to learn this. Um, so uh, here is a picture, a qualitative picture, for example, here in this example, we train it on intraday da data for Apple. What you see is that if you train it on uh, the, only the raw time series, so it's not you using these dynamic strategies, you get the output in the middle. So basically, it is too homogeneous compared to the real data. It's not learning the cross, uh, uh, cross, cross temporal correlations, whereas if you train it with, with the 
dynamic strategy, it, it learns the mean reversion properties and the, uh, and the autocorrelations and so on, so you get something more realistic, which is the one in the bottom. Uh, here is another test with a GARCH 1-1 one, one with student T, so here you have both, both the temporal correlations through the GARCH and then heavy tails. You can see again that training on the raw time series, as is done in the other papers, gives you something in the middle, it is too homogeneous, whereas if you train again with dynamic strategies, you, you get the one in the bottom, which, is, uh, which uh, gives you a good uh, structure for the, for the um, uh, well, but compared to the real data. Of course, these are just pictures, but if you look in the, in the paper, what we try to match is the tail behavior, the, the cross-asset core correlation, patterns and the autocorrelation. So we can show that including dynamic benchmark strategies allows you to learn the cross-asset correlations and the autocorrelations in par particular of, of these time series. So just a last word about scalability to high dimensions. So uh, in the examples I showed, these were one-dimensional examples. In the paper, we also look at how this can scale to dimensions, say, a 50 or 100. So uh, the uh, uh, this is a real pro problem because uh, there are fancy and very sophisticated um, m m models in dimension one, two, and three for simulating uh, low dimensional situations in finance. But once you go to dimensions 50, 100, or 1,000, basically everybody it drops back to, to, to Gaussian factor models because there's nothing else that can scale. Here, this is a method that can scale in the following way. You can include as particular portfolios in your uh, benchmark strategies, what we call the eigen portfolios, which correspond to the principal com components of your covariance structure. In this way, by throwing in these eigen portfolios, implicitly you are going to learn the, uh, the covariance structure of your data. Your simulated data will respect the covariance structure of your data. And this is a linear way of scaling to high, high dimensions. You throw in n eigen portfolios for n, n dimensional of that data set. In, in this way, you capture uh, very uh, efficiently the covariance structure rather than with n squared uh, the covariance matrix size. Okay? So let me just conclude then. So um, what I try to argue in general is, is that I think uh, that, uh, well, the generative AI, everybody uh, says now it, it, it's a powerful tool that is going to invade uh, all applications in fi finance that's already starting to do that. But most uh, attempts up to now have been to take these uh, off-the-shelf algorithms and just apply them to financial time series. I think there are some issues with, with that, and one of them is this model the validation issue. And I think that it shouldn't be a side issue that we deal with a posteriori, but we should really think about what that implies for the design of the model. So here the approach we propose is first think about what you're going to do with the output of the generative model, then design a training criteria which corresponds to the, to the applications you're thinking of, to good performance in those applications, integrate it into your training, and then uh, if you have convergence with the training algorithm, then it means that by construction, you are answering to the validation criteria that you are, are, are requiring the model to perform on. And I just gave you an example with TailGun, but this is just an example. If you're not interested in tails, okay, you can uh, use another loss fun function, but the main idea is think of the training strategies you would apply the, the, um, these, uh, these best scenarios to, and then use the training strategies as projections, which project your high dimensional space to one dimensional uh, PNL space. Then you are in a low, low dimensional space where it's easier to compute things and it's more interpretable. That's the idea. Thank you. So thanks a lot, uh, Rama, for this uh, very clear uh, presentation and for the message. So we understand clearly the message, which says you can use this kind of methodology, but be careful on the choice of a criterion at some point. This is the choice of a criterion which has a structural interpretation, and it is very important to make a link between the different methods you can have, uh, uh, either the automatic method and the more structural method. Uh, maybe there are some uh, questions from the audience. Yes, Peter. Yes. 
also want to train on some exotic payoffs that are not hedgeable but that are still very important for risk management rather than just strategies. Yeah, so if you're in, in interested in, for example, uh, getting uh, correctly the payoffs, the distribution of certain payoffs, you can just include the payoff. That's also a map which takes the scenarios to the uh, to some value, but it's a simple map. It just takes the it com computes the payoff along the path. Yeah, why not? Or you, you can even look at uh, something more sophisticated, which in fact is what. We, we're, we're doing with the Milena Bevoletis, who will talk about this in the talk in Salle de Seance afterwards. You can look at the, uh, the uh, loss distribution of a hedged uh, position. For example, you want, uh, if you want your scenarios to be fine enough to replicate the performance of hedging strategies correctly, uh, you can lo look at uh, an option and the corresponding hedge, um, some hedging strategy along the path, and you want that in the scenarios in the data, the PNL of the hedged uh, uh, of the hedged position be uh, be similar. So this is also something that you can do. In general, I mean, and when I speak about strategy, it can be a hedging strategy for a target payoff. It's not necessarily a. Uh, I mean, in the in the assets, you can include options. Here it's just on raw time series of stocks, but uh, we're doing this, for example, for, for limit order books. For limit order books, it's even more interesting here because if you take limit order books, the units of the data in inputs are not prices. They are, you know, you have these arrays of uh, volumes and so on. But at, at the end, the, the user will use these limit order book scenarios to execute some strategy. It's some uh, execution strategy for trades for something which generates a PNL. So, if if you can uh, write down the strategies, then actually you're going to translate the outputs of the scenarios into a met metric in dollars or euros, where you can actually compare the performance across different stocks, which have totally different limit order book units. So I think it's a, you can think of this as a, as a normalization. It's a, you get a. a a projection that is normalized in some sense, and you can then com then compare the the performance across strategies. So maybe some other question, a quick question, quick yes. answer. Um, <laughs> yeah, your simulation uh, seems to depend a lot on the infinitesimal generator, in particular if you use the, you mentioned the gauge or something like this, or if you use uh, an infinitesimal generator that has uh, fat tails. So how sensitive is the convergence, is the fitting to, to the fact that your infinitesimal generator has uh, non-Gaussian properties? And, uh well, I mean, all the tests here were done either on real day data or on simulated data with heavy tails, like the ones I showed Garch with the student feet. So we never tested on you know, other things. But yeah, I mean, you, you learn, you target the loss distribution, so if you include as specific benchmark strategies, the buy and hold strategies, it, the first thing it does is tries to match the tails. So you, so you will catch the heavy tails by co construction. Yeah. Maybe I will ask two, uh, two very small questions. One which is technical, but uh, when you apply your methodology with a VAR, this is for a given critical level 95%, yeah. for instance. If you reapply with 90%, how do you ensure a monotonicity for instance. Yes, very good uh, question. So, uh, so there is VAR and expected shortfall. It's the pair. So, uh, uh, as you know, the expected shortfall is the average of VARs beyond al alpha, and you can include here more than one level. So, in the application, we in included uh, actually four levels. We have one percent and ninety-nine percent, and then five percent and ninety-five percent. You can include more, and in fact, y as you know, if you include all the quantiles, you match the, all the di distribution, but it becomes computationally you know, heavier because each time you add one more term to the gradient and so on. But in principle, you can add several, uh, but it's important to in include uh, two asymmetric levels, alpha and one minus alpha, to pin down both sides. And then if you're interested in uh, different levels, like, such as 5% and 1%, you can include both. My second question was on the dogs. On the dogs, so you have some visual inspection with similarity. If I am interested in commodity prices, we see that we have speculative bubbles. And so visually, what you can see, how do you introduce yes, these yes. visual things 
yes, in yes. your methodology so, and the strategy to profit of this robot? Yes, exactly. That's, that's a very good question. So um, if you introduce momentum strategies in your set of benchmark strategies, and in fact, this is the example we use in the paper, momentum strategies try to capture short-term trends. And so if you're able to replicate the PNL distribution of momentum strategies, it means you are trying to match the, the, the variations in the short-term trends uh, in the simulated paths with the real paths. So this is exactly what we do. We for, use of also the returns that is to have a change. Yeah, yeah. So you have to look at the, the trends and how, how they shift. And um, so this is uh, if you include trend following strategies, momentum strategies with different horizons, then you are trying exactly to do this. Thanks a lot. So we have to thanks again, Rama. Thank